Hello again. These two friendly skeletons are Nat and Bolt. As you can tell by their awful posture, they're poor and they're sick of it. It's cats they're after. Millions of them, preferably. Anyway, how better to achieve their goal than by buying a load of hivers and starting a hash farm? It won't be easy, but with perseverance, a little luck and some finely aged cheese, I believe in them. Having started way up here in northern Sincoon, they'll first head into the Great Desert, the land of the slavers. But as you may or may not know, slaves aren't typically free, so they're going to need some startup capital. As they make their way towards the Great Desert's many cities, they'll engage in one of Kenshi's great pastimes, robbing corpses amongst ongoing combat. Arming themselves with some basic arms and armor and holding on to whatever else they can carry, they run along and flog it in the nearest town. But the nearest town is a dump, so they're not staying, going further on to Bark instead, a larger seaside town with slave shops and other useful traders. Now, slavery in Kenshi is a surprisingly underdeveloped feature, considering how large a part it plays law-wise over on this side of the map. When you buy a slave in Kenshi, you're actually freeing them. Whether or not they decide to join you is basically 50-50. After earning a few cats the hard way, through gruelling manual labour, the pair buy themselves their first, uh, paid friend, as well as a small shack in which to build some storage for copper ore, to allow the mining process to be automated. But one hiver a farm does not make. Not and Bolt are going to need to do some serious continent scouring. There's hivers out there for the purchasing, they just need to find them, whilst their new friend Spade slaves away, uh, I mean, works, voluntarily, back here in Bark at the copper deposits. I reckon about six hivers total should do the trick. So with a steady flow of cats appearing in Nut and Bolt's joint online banking account from Spade, they're running town to town in search of hivers. You might ask, Hazor, why hivers? Couldn't other races do the job just as well? And yes, but there's just something particularly submissive about these little bug boys that I rather like. Anyway, my personal preferences aside, here's the gang. We've got Spade, Photo, Green, Ribs, Jinsei, and Slowline. Hivers of various shapes and sizes, all raring to get to some serious hemp farming. The plan is to make use of a particularly broken area of the map to keep our grow up safe from the grabby hands of raiders and the like. Shem. Shem has a few features that make it conducive to our goals. 1. The land can quite happily grow hemp. 2. There's plenty of stone and ore. And 3. These pools make for a base that's, um, well let's just say defensible for now, you'll see. If you've ever built a base in Kenshi, you'll know that the neighbours tend to be rather aggressively unwelcoming when you pitch up in what they perceive to be their neighbourhood. But I have a plan for that. Part one of our plan is to buy books and research at our shack in Bark all of the things we'll need to make our base pretty much impervious to attack. Which means mounted crossbows and walls or buildings to mount them on. Then we'll hoard a large quantity of building materials and start working on wall building enclosing at least one copper and iron deposit as well as a stone mine. But Hazor, with just a few crossbows and people to man them, raiders are going to get to your gates and smash them down long before you can shoot them all to death. No. You see, my master plan, as I alluded to earlier, involves this puddle here. It could have been any of them, but I chose this one. It's deep, it's wet, and it's warm. But most importantly, its diameter is substantial. If you were to swim across it, it would take you a while. You might have figured out where this is going. Because when raiders come to give you an unfriendly visit in Kenshi, they're very courteous about it and will always come directly to your gates, even if that means swimming to them. And there's a button somewhere in the menus here that toggles your turret gunners between waiting for someone to take a hostile action before opening fire, and just letting rip as soon as they can line up a good shot. If we adopt that castle doctrine mentality and save the questions for once the shooting has stopped, then we should be able to set up our greasy little hashish industry in peace behind the safety of our walls. Right now though, we just have a husk of a hash farm, capable of making our own building materials and some dried up cactus for the hivers to eat. We need to do quite a lot more research before we can get things set up efficiently and start making some serious cats here. Which means we need normal books, blue books and some of these red paper things too. So whilst the bugs slave away at base, 
building up a healthy stock of building materials and basically anything else they can make here. Nut and Bolt are headed out to buy those books and loot a few of the less guarded ancient locations on the map. Because despite their ambitions, Nut and Bolt are only capable of fighting if they have a totally unfair advantage over the enemies. In a fair fight, just about anything in the game will put them on their metallic asses. But that's fine, they're farmers, not fighters. And as farmers, they need more advanced mining and refining technologies to support a growing hashish manufactory, naturally. Thankfully then, there are ways and means of acquiring what they need in a completely pacifist manner. Because whilst Kenshi's wide array of bugs and unplanned features often taketh away, teleporting raiders over your walls, for example, they giveth just as often. We can make use of the questionable AI and pathfinding to be able to sit here lockpicking boxes in the ancient lab right underneath the mechanical noses of the guard bots. Thanks to his use of this completely legitimate strategy, Nut is able to liberate a healthy stack of ancient science books and engineering research. Enough to research and implement the considerably more powerful harpoon turret to defend what's rightfully ours. Which is so far a pretty small farm, but it's growing all the time. And you might notice that the walls have been gradually shifting further and further out around the pond to give any would-be raiders a much longer swim under fire in order to get to the gate. But it's time to get serious. We need to start making hash. Which means we need to generate more power because the hemp processors use quite a lot of energy. More windmills, more efficient batteries, and a biofuel generator for backup should do the trick. But now we need more hemp. A lot more hemp. Each of these fields grows 40 plants, and 5 hemp mixed with some water becomes 1 hashish. The market value of hash is 144 cats, but that's not really the whole story. You see hash is illegal, and therefore carries a hefty price markup in most markets. A little ways through this mountain pass we find Flats Lagoon, an elevated settlement where the sale of hash is completely legal, and there are plenty of wealthy traders to buy it at a 500% markup meaning each sticky chunk of the stuff is worth 715 cats, which makes every hemp harvested effectively worth 143 cats, which means each harvest from a large farm is worth 5,720 cats once processed. We currently have three such farms. It's time to expand, which means we should probably get more farmhands. Nut heads to Heng and buys Slick, who is promptly put to work in the hemp fields. After a few more trips back and forth between Flats Lagoon and the farm, the cash situation was looking pretty good, so Nut paid a visit to a plastic surgeon to get his posture and height adjusted to better suit his bank balance. He then headed out looking for even more hivers, since I realised there was one in particular I had missed. A rather special hiver that we all know and love. Beep. Nut introduces himself and then off Beep runs back to the farms whilst Nut spends a few days training crossbows against leviathans up north. I'm doing this because I want to appropriate a certain blueprint from someone later. I don't really know how a crossbow will help in that situation, I sort of just wanted to go to an exotic place and shoot at a big dangerous animal from complete safety. That's what rich people do after all, right? Anyway, once he's got his kicks on the Leviathan coast, Nut heads back home to ferry more wares to Flats Lagoon. Whilst he's there standing guard, Bolt goes to visit the same surgeon to get his frame adjusted too. So now the two of them stand as glorious chads looking over their little kingdom of dirt. Sticky, stinky dirt. We can take some time now to just focus on making cats. Nut runs to Flats Lagoon every day or so with a load of the sticky good stuff to flog to the traders who just really can't get enough of the stuff. After doing this for, well, actually quite a long time, our goal is achieved. One million cats. Isn't it beautiful? But it's not really enough to just be wealthy, is it? It'd be better if Nut and Bolt were wealthy and could also run at highway speeds whilst carrying backpacks full of hash. Which means that we need to remove their arms and legs with a device called a peeler. That's what the blueprint I mentioned earlier is for, and is in the possession of a man named Savant, the leader of the Skin Bandits. Whilst at this point Nut is capable of flinging some bolts, the two bots still really can't handle any actual combat, so we'll have to resort to darker tactics. Off to Sonorous Dark, Nut and Bolt go, walking into Savant's home and just waiting. You see, being a stupid fleshy human, Savant goes to sleep every day. Wrong move, fleshbag. Don't get me wrong, Nut and Bolt aren't going to hurt him or anything. 
They're just going to pick him up like the dommy mommies they are, take his stuff and then put him back to bed. <laughs> the pair run to a few of the game's higher-end robotics shops in Mongrel and Black Desert City to pick up some shiny specialist robotic limbs before heading back to base to construct their very own peeler machines. Which to anyone else is a foul and inhumane device, but to Nut and Bolt it's their apotheosis, their ascension to robotic godhood. The pair each step into their own peelers to have their limbs systematically removed under the watchful eyes of their slaves, which you'd think would be the ideal opportunity for them to free themselves from their robotic masters. But like I said earlier, they're good and submissive bug boys. They would never do such a thing. Unless… No, no, they're good. Once Nut and Bolt are reduced to their torsos, they're taken to a nearby skeleton repair bed to recover from the process. Then they can reassemble themselves however they please. Both go for a pair of scout legs for speed and industrial lifter arms for strength. At this point, Nut and Bolt seemingly have it all. An impregnable fortress of a base, an infinite source of cats, a modular system of gloriously powerful limbs, and most importantly, they have that gigachad posture. They could continue to scale up the operation and progress onwards to even more ridiculous levels of wealth, but unlike the business leaders of Earth, Nut and Bolt know when enough is enough. Besides, there's no Lambos or dodgy submarine rides to sink money into in Kenshi, so realistically what are they even going to spend all of this on anyway? No, they're just going to spend the rest of their presumably near-infinite robot lifespans manning their harpoon turrets, slaughtering any flesh bags that come close. Because isn't that what it's all really about anyway? If you don't want to end up floating face down in Nut and Bolt's corpse pond, you should probably like the video. Whatever you do though, please remain indoors. There's beak things outside, and they're starving because all of their usual food is in the pond. Thank you as ever for watching, and until next time, goodbye.